So, okay. Here we go, everybody. Thank you, uh, and uh, welcome, everybody, to the championship round of the 2020 Coolidge Cup. Uh, my name is Jared Rhodes, and uh, I am the director of the debate program here with the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, and it has been a great week. Um, over 90 students from 25 different states and two different countries. First time we've had the uh, International Coolidge Cup. Um, have joined us uh, this week to, to, to compete in speech and debate. Uh, we've had close to 60 different judges. It takes a lot of community judges um, to, uh, to, to do this kind of event. We've had hundreds of speeches written, delivered, and evaluated. And now here we are down to two finalists in this championship round. Mm -hmm. uh, for anyone joining us just now, um, the Coolidge Cup is our end of school year national invitational tournament. Um, all the students who competed in our tournament this week had to do something special just to get here. Um, and they've all done uh, extremely well um, uh, in, their, in their regular season to get here and then uh, also here. Um, they had to uh, you know, win some other tournament or place highly in some other competition. We had a series of tournaments ourselves. We had a series of online competitions as well over the year, adapting along the way. Um, and that is, uh, that is not easy uh, to, to grapple with, but we've done a good job. On the affirmative side today, we have uh, Matthew Tweeden. On the negative side today, we have Caleb Sampson. So Hello. welcome you two, thank you. Um, this, uh, this round will run about 40 minutes or so in total. The, the speech time is close to 30, but if they, if they choose to use their um, uh, prep time, uh, then that could be as much as five minutes per student. Um, if they do take prep time, let's all be quiet. Uh, we should all mute ourselves um, during, the, during the round, of course. Um, you're welcome to leave your videos on because we like to see smiling faces instead of uh, just names on, on otherwise blank screens. Um, but what I, I uh, uh, the, the, the details of the, of the Coolidge debate format are available online if you wish to take a look. Um, but for now, I, I think you should just relax and focus on our students and, and listen to them uh, engage in some, some great debate. Um, our judge panel is composed of nine esteemed members of our community and friends of the Coolidge Foundation. Um, let me give you a brief introduction uh, of each person and, uh, and then we'll begin. I promise these will be uh, pretty brief here. On our judge panel, uh, first and foremost, we have Mr. Bob Luddy. See him right there. Actually, Mr. Bob Luddy, I'm going to rename you from iPad 8 to Bob Luddy. How about that? <laughs> Uh, Mr. Luddy is the founder and CEO of Captivair Systems and a Coolidge Foundation trustee and a major benefactor of our program. Thank you so much for your generosity. We have also on the, um, on the judge panel tonight, we have Dr. Ben Voth, Coolidge Debate Fellow and Director of Debate and Speech at uh, Southern Methodist University. You were hearing from him just a moment before. Hello, Ben. Oh, and wearing the sash too. Yes, that's one of the details that we don't uh, get to partake in when we're all in different locations. Uh, we have Catherine Bassett on the line, Coolidge essay winner uh, from several years ago, former Coolidge Foundation intern and also a 2020 Hillsdale graduate. Where are you, Catherine? Hello, mm -hmm. with the wave, thank you. Uh, do we have Maggie Seidel on the line? Where is Maggie looking for? She says, hello, then she'll pop. Oh, there she I'm, is. I'm here. Excellent. Okay, we have so many people. We've got close to 60 people on the line. This is great. Uh, Maggie Seidel, who we uh, heard from last night, uh, or the, her, the students heard from last night, is senior advisor and the policy director uh, for the Office of the Governor of South Dakota. Dakota. We have, uh, I believe we had Dr. Brett Rush on the line. Let me just verify that. Yes, we do. Welcome, Dr. Rush. Uh, Brett Rush is the executive director of the White River Junction VA Medical Center here in Vermont. He's a practicing psychiatrist and a mental health expert. Um, also an assistant professor of psychiatry at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. So welcome, Brett. Uh, we have Anthony Barrow, Barry Hill, sorry. Anthony Barrow Hill is the owner of 
Ivy League Hacker, a college admissions uh, coaching company. And he studied political science at Yale and at Stanford, and he has uh, extensive experience coaching LD, Lincoln Douglas debate. Welcome, Anthony. We have Eric Bing, uh, professor of global health in the Department of Applied Physiology and Wellness at Southern Methodist University. Hello, Eric. We've got Zoe Lovelace on the line as well as a judge. She is the 2016 Coolidge, Ch Cup, Coolidge Cup champion. Uh, she's a returning Coolidge mm -hmm. Cup judge, a frequent judge for us. Thank you so much. And uh, also and currently a Dartmouth undergraduate. Mm -hmm. And finally, rounding out the uh, panel, uh, lastly, it's, it's me, uh, Jared Rhodes. I'm the, as I mentioned, I'm the director of the debate program here at the Coolidge Foundation. Uh, and I'm also an instructor at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice and a health policy researcher uh, at the Mercatus Center. So that is our panel of nine. And I think our debaters uh, should be just about ready to get, get going here. Uh, once again, the, the resolution that our two finalists here are going to be debating is resolved. The benefits of the shutdown of the US economy due to the coronavirus are worth the costs. And with that, I will turn it over to our first speaker. And we'll just remind everybody to mute if you're not planning to debate right now. Thank you so much, Mr. Rhodes. And briefly, just a couple quick thank yous. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to my mother, father, and sister who have been so patient and quiet with me running debate out of the center of our house. My incredible debate coach, Kathleen Feroz, whose unyielding confidence in me has meant so much over the years. The incredible friends I've made through the Coolidge Foundation over the past three years competing in this tournament. And of course, our friends at the Coolidge Foundation, Ms. Schles, Mr. Denhart, Mr. Rhodes, Dr. Voth, Mr. Hammer, and the man behind this event, Mr. Luddy. Know that you have become an integral part of my summer, and for that, I cannot thank you enough. With that said, as everybody is ready, I will be beginning. There is only one form of political strategy in which I have any confidence, and that is to try to do the right thing and sometimes be able to succeed. Even amid the fog of confusion, these words of Calvin Coolidge remain true to this day. In spite of unparalleled uncertainty, American leaders took action in responding to the coronavirus pandemic, shutting down the American economy to help stop the spread, gain an understanding of the challenge we faced, and importantly, to help bring about confidence in a time of trepidation. It is for this reason I proudly affirm that resolved, the benefits of the shutdown of the U.S. economy due to the coronavirus are worth the costs. Before proceeding, it's important I define the scope of this debate. In a I affirm that short, strict lockdowns are superior to long, drawn-out disruptions to economic conditions and health systems. For these reasons, the resolution is best viewed through a lens of weighing consequences, particularly the unseen benefits of this lockdown. Let us not fall victim to our fear, but seek to create clarity and focus in a turbulent world. My first contention is that the shutdown generated economic stability. The most important factor in a strong economy is not raw production or consumption, but predictability. A predictable condition can be planned for, responded to, and benefited from, and the coronavirus lockdowns were a gateway to certainty. On March 18th, Senior Fellow for Global Health at the Council on Foreign Relations, Lori Garrett, warned that, sorry America, the full lockdown is coming. At this point, though, the future course of action was still unknown, and the market reflected this fact, as the Dow Jones Industrial Average hit its four-year low, and we plunged from record highs into a bear market. However, data from the IMF shows that beginning on March 23rd, the market began to regain ground. Simultaneously, states were shutting down. You may wonder why a downturn in economic activity triggered market recovery, but it all comes back to certainty. In a shutdown world, the economy wasn't really shut down, but rather intentionally slowed down. This allowed for companies to reassess their priorities and investors to refocus their resources, which in turn created a new normal. Not the economy we wanted, but not a nightmare scenario. However, uncertainty returned as states began reopening. Just two days ago, Federal Reserve officials expressed concern that the U.S. could enter a significantly worse recession if coronavirus cases continued to surge. After three months of steady economic recovery, the hasty reopening has renewed the sense of fear that plagued markets this spring. From a purely financial perspective, a short and strict economic shutdown has long-term benefits that easily outweigh the costs. My second contention is that lockdowns save lives. Allow me to stress this point, lockdowns save 
lives. And while the negative may argue that a second wave is an inevitable outcome of the shutdown, this argument is ignorant of why lockdowns work. The International Monetary Fund explained on June 2nd that the purpose of economic shutdown is not to allow the virus to blow over, but rather to spread out its damage to a manageable level, creating time to research treatment and take necessary action to better equip our hospitals. In fact, the effects of such action are clear in the United States today. Evaluating two peer-reviewed studies, NPR reported on June 9th that without the shutdown, the U.S. would have surpassed 5 million cases by early April. Three months later, we have yet to break 3 million. These studies conclude that the shutdown was responsible for preventing tens of millions of infections and millions of deaths in the United States alone. Amid uncertainty, it is better to err on the side of caution. It is better to shut down and save lives. My third and final contention is that the shutdown prepared the American economy for future crises. Simply put, shutdowns are the byproduct of being unprepared. Rabi Torbay of Brown University Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies explains last month that even as we fight the spread of this pandemic, we must keep our eye on the next one. Widespread shutdowns are the unfortunate cost of not adequately prioritizing and funding pandemic preparedness. Our health system lacked the detection, containment, and treatment capabilities necessary to avoid a lockdown. And without this shutdown, there is no incentive to prepare for the next. While countless studies will be conducted over the coming years on this crisis and its response, perhaps the most important one has already been written. In 2009, renowned economists Andrew Healy and Neil Mahotra published in the American Political Science Review their analysis of the 2005 Hurricane Katrina disaster, in which they concluded that for every dollar spent on emergency preparedness, $15 are saved in disaster relief. However, preparedness is politically worthless, while response is a platform for national attention. Without the American public realizing the first-hand effects of a crisis, the necessary resources will never be dedicated to preparing for the future. And this issue is more important than ever, as earlier this week, the New York Times reported that a widespread swine flu, a variant of H1N1 originating in China, has transmitted to humans and could realistically be the next global pandemic we face. This shutdown is giving companies and organizations the chance to transform how they operate and giving the public a platform to demand preparedness for future crises. This past March, the United States was a nation in the grips of fear and uncertainty, but public officials stepped up to the challenge and dared to take action. And through this, they saved millions of lives, calmed the nerves of investors, and paved a path to long-term emergency preparedness. Undeniably, the benefits of economic shutdown outweigh the costs, and thus I affirm. Is everybody ready? I'd like to begin by an analyzing the lens through which you view the rounds. You mentioned short and strict lockdowns time and time again. Would you describe the United States lockdown as short and strict? Sure. So the reason why we're affirming a short and strict lockdown is because the United States response was not uh, unilateral. I'd like, to, I'd like to stop you right there. I'm so sorry. But are we affirming a short and strict lockdown or the actual lockdown in the United States? The fundamental the question of this debate is a lockdown economy versus an open economy. That is the central question today. Thus, we agree that we are is talking affirming lockdowns. I'm so sorry, but can you please read the resolution for me? Yes, the resolution states, resolved the benefits of the shutdown of the U.S. economy due to the coronavirus are worth the cost. Now, I'll refer you to you right the there. college debate. Matthew, can I please? Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. So we're specifically analyzing the U.S. shutdown of the U.S. economy, correct? Yes. So as we look and at does the that clarify brief, that the it fundamental is question of this round, lockdown? the fundamental Matthew, question so of this round, I'm going to answer your question. The fundamental question of this round is a lockdown economy versus an opened economy. The next question we then Matthew, have to ask. You would agree that we are talking about the resolution and the fundamental question is to answer the question of the resolution. Is that correct? Yes. The fundamental purpose of this event is to engage with the heart of the debate. In the Coolidge exactly. debate, we've clearly spelled out what that was. Now, I'm going to say one other thing. Because there was no single response from the United States federal government, it is the affirmative position to determine what a lockdown means in the context of the resolution, you because I should not whatever the lockdown means. every single state's response. I'm so sorry, Matthew. Matthew, I'm going to stop you there. I'm asking questions right now. So you yes, are saying that you can pick and choose the question, you can pick and choose the policies used by the United States. You're claiming that you can defend specific policies at the expense of other policies. Are you not defending the United States lockdown as a whole? Sure. So we are defending the idea of lockdown. That is the question of the debate. And I will defend that through the rest of this round, because at the end of the day, that's what this resolution asks. Moreover, because there is no single response, the only way to adequately engage in debate that is fair for both sides to be able to engage on equal ground Matthew, is the fundamental question. 
we are out of time, Matthew. Thank you so much for your answers. Are all my judges ready? As well as my opponent? Let's go ahead and begin. It was President Calvin Coolidge that once said, I favor the policy of economy, not because I wish to save money, but because I wish to save people. I absolutely agree with the namesake of this foundation because our economy impacts our people. And when we lock down that economy, it is quite literally dangerous. Because of this, I believe that the benefits of the shutdown of the US economy due to coronavirus are not worth the costs. Now, before I delve into my main points, we need to understand one fundamental clarifying aspect of this resolution. We are debating the resolution, not my opponent's interpretation of the resolution. The resolution specifically says we are talking about United States lockdown policy. We're not picking and choosing United States lockdown policies. We are analyzing them in their whole as they are. Moving forward to my two main points. First, that the lockdown harmed American livelihoods through economic recklessness. And second, that the lockdown harmed American health through economic-induced medical complications and healthcare system tunnel vision. Understanding this, let's begin with point one, that the coronavirus lockdown destroyed the economy, harming American livelihoods. Beginning in March, a wave of state and national legislation has caused our economy to slow to a grinding halt. On April 15th, the Yale Tobin Center for Economic Policy outlined exactly how much the, uh, the lockdown would cost Americans. Quote, GDP will be reduced by 35% during the lockdown, which would equate to economic losses on the order of 19 billion American dollars per day. That's $19 billion a day that families cannot use to put food on the table, pay college tuition, even to afford medical bills. But even more, and I cannot stress this enough, the damages will be long-term due to the lockdown. According to the Congressional Budget Office, order over the next 10 years, we will have losses of $7.9 trillion because of lockdown and GDP will suffer 3%. When corporations are forcibly prevented from conducting normal business, they lose profits and can't afford to pay their employees. Through this chain of events, the lockdown is directly responsible for also destroying American jobs. This is outlined by the Congressional Budget Office. Quote, the labor market is projected to see the steepest deterioration since the 1930s. The unemployment rate is expected to average 15%. 15% unemployment means millions of Americans living paycheck to paycheck no longer have a way to provide for their families. My opponent calls that stability. I call that an outrage. According to the Rand Corporation, more than 38 million workers have applied to get unemployment insurance since March 15th. And many of these 38 million will never get their jobs back. For as the Becker Friedman Institute for Economics at the University of Chicago projects, 32 to 42% of COVID-induced layoffs will be permanent. But there is yet another group of Americans hardest hit by coronavirus lockdown, small businesses. For a May 12th study by Harvard University and the University of Chicago, found that more than 100,000 American small businesses have closed permanently. This leads me to my second point. The shutdown has harmed American health. Now, I know that you're probably thinking that the whole point of the lockdown is to save American lives, but by oversimplifying a complex public health crisis, the economic shutdown is harming health rather than helping. The first way it does so is through economy-induced medical issues. This is best explained by Till Von Wachter, job loss researcher and UCLA professor. Quote, Rises in unemployment during large recessions can set in motion a domino effect of reduced income, additional stress, and healthy unlifestyles. These setbacks mean people die earlier. Since the beginning of the shutdown, depression, suicide, drug abuse, and domestic violence have been on the rise, and this does have an impact on public health. Now, MIT Connection Science fellow Alexander Lipton found that for every $17 million in income loss, an additional death occurs. When this was applied to the shutdown of the U.S. economy due to coronavirus, they found that economic losses, quote, would translate to 65,000 lives lost in the United States for each month because of the economic shutdown. The second way that the shutdown harms American health is through medical tunnel vision. Right now, hospitals are putting nearly all of their resources into fighting coronavirus, taking time and money away from other medical issues with extreme consequences. According to Scott Atlas, physician and senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, found on May 25th of 2020 that stroke evaluations are down 40%. 50% of chemo recipients aren't receiving their treatments. Three quarters of cancer screenings aren't happening, and there are 85% fewer living donor translates. He found that this ultimately added up to, an, to a total loss 1.5 million human life years. So at the end of the day, 
it's important to fight COVID-19. But if we make that fight more important than American livelihood and American health, we forget what we are fighting in the first place. And it is for this reason that I strongly negate the resolution. Thank you. Great, if everybody's ready for questioning. Yes, sir. To start, will prolonged economic uncertainty result in long-term supply chain disruptions? Prolonged supply chain disruptions? To a certain extent, yes, but we need to understand that the lockdown has, analyzing costs and benefits, caused far more damage, both empirically speaking yes, and at a day-to-day -day -day level. Now, as a follow-up, did the market stabilize after we went into lockdown? After we went into lockdown? Well, if by stabilize you mean it tanked the largest amount that it has since the 2008 recession, I suppose so, you could say stabilize. Then why were all of those tankings prior to states going into lockdown, if it isn't the lockdown that brought stability? You have specific statistics that state that it was I read the IMF evidence that shows all the crashes happened before March 23rd when the economy began to recover and states went into lockdown March 23rd and later. March 23rd and later? Not March 15th and later? Uh, March 23rd and later is the evidence that consistently states were in lockdown across the board. That is when we saw the lowest point and we saw recovery from then on. So explain to me, if shutdowns weren't stabilizing the economy, what was? Well, a general consensus about knowledge about the coronavirus can stabilize an economy. It's not just a shutdown that stabilizes the economy. Understanding the death rates, understanding how dangerous exactly sure. the coronavirus uh, is with additional March scientific March. research can stabilize the economy as well. Governments are known for not being you let me ask a question. Between March 15th and March 23rd, what key scientific breakthroughs occurred that allowed us to stabilize the economy? The answer is none. Was it not the shutdowns that led to stabilization? Now, what I'm saying is that the research came after the 23rd, and you can say that some of the stabilization came due to lockdown, but I can also say that additional scientific research, understanding of the coronavirus, development of hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, and first clinical trials of a vaccination when all of those factor into the stability as well. So it's not just one variable that needs to be accounted for regarding market stability. When did we get that research? When was this coming in? When was what coming in specifically? This research you're talking about. It was April, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. With that said, we are at time. I will be taking running prep starting now. Let's see prep time at 115 used. When my judges and opponent are ready. Absolutely. As a brief off time roadmap, I'll be starting with the framework for the round and then going down to the negative case when everyone's ready. All right, I'll be starting now. My opponent through much of his cross-examination period focused on one issue, what the question of today's debate is. So I'll simplify it. Shutdowns or no shutdowns? That is the question we are asking today for two key reasons. First, I'll refer you to the Coolidge debate brief, which is the governing document of this event, which states the challenging question is, after you take into account everything on both sides of the ledger, do the benefits of economic shutdown outweigh the costs? The question is exclusively shutdown. We cannot adequately judge it unique to the United States in its exact action for one key reason, and that's because states took different responses. As a result, the affirmative is advocating in a general sense 
shutdowns, whereas the negative has the burden of generally arguing against shutdowns. That is the simple view of the round judges. That is what the debate topic is asking. That is the highest ground today. Let's move down to my opponent's case. Starting off on the issue of the economy, I will extend my argumentation, which showed the need for market stability. My opponent wasn't actually able to engage with this because he couldn't show uniquely what was stabilizing the market other than lockdowns. Moreover, in the negative world, we see a cycle of shutting down and reopening from which we see continued economic damage because of supply chain disruptions. A team of 18 leading economists studied the ramifications of economic shutdown on supply chains and published their findings in the journal Nature on June 3rd. Their conclusion was that short-term lockdowns are better than long-term slowdowns. The authors write that earlier, stricter, and shorter lockdowns can minimize overall losses. The complexity of global supply chains will magnify losses beyond the direct results of COVID-19. They went on to estimate that extending a period of economic uncertainty from two months to six would ultimately cost $10 trillion worldwide through a disruption of supply chains. And supply chain disruptions uniquely hurt the United States more so than other nations because of how intertwined our economy is. So when we extend this period of economic uncertainty, we are only seeing harms to the United States because of long-term supply chain disruptions. Moreover, my opponent talks about the issue of unemployment, but we will see unemployment exacerbated if we go into the very recession I talked about, the one that Federal Reserve officials warned about from reopening to early. Next, we need to talk about my opponent's second contention on the idea of healthcare system tunnel vision. First, he estimates that he saved 65,000 lives. And while that is admirable, I'll restate affirmative evidence that says we are saving millions of lives in the world of the affirmative. But perhaps more importantly, my opponent talks about the lack of other screening and testing that we see in hospitals. However, if we did not shut down the economy, we would have seen hospital overcrowding, meaning even the most dire instances of people needing access to these resources, they would not be able to, uh, to, to be able to get access to that. So if we have or we are exacer or if we negate, we are exacerbating every single issue that my opponent speaks about. We worsen the economy by bringing in recession, by undermining stability through predictability, and perhaps most importantly of all, through crippling supply chains. Next, we see a rush on hospitals. We see mass death. We see widespread disaster in this country, all because we were not willing to put down our concern for the almighty dollar today and realize the long-term effects. For all these reasons, we must affirm. I'd like to go ahead and begin my prep time. Five minutes starting now. I'll stop my prep time at two minutes and 37 seconds.
All right. So if all my judges are ready, as well as my opponent. In this second negative constructive, I'd like to simple things down into three different points. First, the lens of the resolution, second, health, and finally, economy. Beginning with that first point, lenses of the resolution. My opponent continues to state without any support that we are only going to be picking and choosing the ways in which we view shutdown. He claims that we will be examining short and strict lockdown policies, and he does so by failing to acknowledge two key words in the resolution, U.S. economy. We're talking about the shutdown of the U.S. economy in its actuality, not necessarily a short and strict lockdown, not necessarily the lockdown that provides certainty. We are examining the United States as a whole in actuality. I am so sorry I set my timer for five minutes instead of three minutes. I'm at 4.10. I'm going to reset it for 2.10. So we must examine the United States in actuality. It's not necessarily going to be short, and uncertainty will be inevitable given the fact that governments do tend to vector in uncertainty. Understanding this, let's move to my second point, health. And I have three points under this. Point one, hospitals had resources. Hospitals had resources. According to the American Hospital Association, there are 96,596 total ICU beds in the United States. And according to the University of Washington, at the peak of the coronavirus, only 17,981 ICU beds were in use. So what we can see from this is the hospital system overestimated the, the amount of space that it was going to have to use. And as such, hospitals did have resources and we wouldn't have overwhelmed anyway. My second point under health is faulty stats. Faulty stats. My opponent continues to claim that the lockdown will save millions of lives, but the only statistic that factors in millions of lives being saved by coronavirus is the Imperial College model that has been disproved time and time again. According to the American Institute for Economic Research, the 2.2 million death projection was off by several orders of magnitude. Understanding this, we can see that his millions of deaths statistic is absolutely baseless because it has been disproven and because the math was incorrect. Which leads me to point three under health, costs are ignored. Costs are ignored. We will lose 1.5 million years of life, and every month 65,000 people will die from economy-induced health issues, which leads me to my third point, the economy, the economy. And I have three subpoints. One, predictability is a factor, not the entirety. A factor, not the entirety. We need to understand that predictability, while important, is not the only aspect of any economy. And there are multiple aspects to that predictability. There is knowledge of COVID-19, as well as government shutdowns. And my opponent simplifying that down into just as one statistic is unwarranted, which leads me to two, unemployment. Unemployment is at 38 million, 100,000 small businesses have lost their revenue. And we need greater stability for the future, but that is not going to come through government lockdown because my opponent is defending the lockdown in its entirety, not just short and strict, whatever that lockdown will look like. And for all of these reasons, I strongly negate. All right, I'll be taking my last little bit of prep time starting now.
Anita, don't turn me into marketable plushies. All right, I will cease prep time, having used all five minutes. So at the leisure of my judges and opponent, when everyone's ready. As a brief off time roadmap, I will engage with the three points given my opponent, expand upon it, and then finish with voting issues. All right, I'll be beginning. My opponent starts off by addressing the framework of this round, the scope of the resolution, and says I'm only picking and choosing what I'm defending, to which I say, one, he did not engage with the defense of direct quotes from the Coolidge brief, the one he and I both agreed to debate under. Second, he did not engage with the fact that this is the most defendable position, the most reasonable for both sides to be able to understand what the other is saying. And finally, I have to ask, to what end? What difference does it make? He has not shown uniquely how my advocacy differentiates from results that would not work under under his own view. So don't even buy his line of argumentation here because he hasn't shown why it matters. Next, let's jump down to talking about health. My opponent first says that the peak was significantly lower than the number of ICU beds we had. Yeah, that's the point of the lockdown. We locked down so we didn't have hospital overcrowding. He is proving my point by reading this evidence. We accomplished the end goal with that. That is a point for the affirmative. Next, on the idea of faulty statistics, I'll read evidence effectively from Columbia University that says had we, closed the, had we started the shutdown one week earlier, we would have saved 36,000 lives. This isn't on the Imperial College model. This is from new modeling that came out this week as reported by the New York Times. And finally, my opponent says that I'm ignoring the number of costs. Moreover, I am winning on the economic argument. So even if you want to say there are economic damages that affect the health infrastructure, I'm winning on econ and I'll explain that as we jump up to the economic argument. He only made two responses. First, he concedes that predictability is a factor but argues it is not key. Well, first I'd ask what else is key and what uniquely caused the restabilization of the economy. Next, I'll read from Douglas Holtz Eakin, a member of the Council of Economic Advisors for both President Bush's, who says, quote, you have to slow the spread of the virus because the thing that is 100% correlated with the decline in economic activity is that everyone's afraid and so they withdraw from economic life, end quote. Economists literally agree that predictability and stability is integral to the success of our marketplaces, of our economic structures. So if we want to avoid negative economic impacts, we have to affirm. Next, he did not engage with the idea of long-term supply chain disruptions and this would devastate his unemployment argumentation because we see lasting economic damage here in the United States. Again, a line of argumentation he did not touch. $10 trillion if we extend market slowdowns rather than looking at short, closed, uh, short, strict lockdowns. Finally, uh, we need to talk about the idea of a reopening recession. Again, another line of argumentation he did not engage with. We will see recession as the Federal Reserve predicts if we go through a hasty reopening. The two, in 2020, the National Bureau for Economic Research this past May explained that negative public health shocks can have enormous effects on labor markets that ends up dwarfing the policies designed to mitigate the epidemic itself using labor market activity and new weekly unemployment claims covered under each worker per state. So effectively, what we're seeing is that the long-term economic damage is going to be greater in the negative world. Next, let's jump up to my side of the case. He ignored the single most important argument in today's round, and that's my third key contention, the fact that we need to be prepared for future crises. All of the harms of this instance will repeat. Whether you agree that lockdowns work or don't, one factor remains, and that's pandemics are a bad thing. However, they will repeat if we do not take action. In the lockdown gave the political incentive necessary for us to focus on disaster preparedness in the future. Judges, circle this argument on your notes because he did not engage with it at all. I will tell you the two reasons you're voting affirmative today. 
First, the short-term effects. We can see that we are saving lives today, regardless of whether or not you buy the Imperial College model, we are still saving lives by preventing hospital overcrowding, and this is a fact that has not been disputed. Second, we need short-term economic stability to prevent further layoffs that my opponent speaks against. The second reason you're voting affirmative today is in the long term, maintaining supply chains that are integral to the uh, that are integral to the strength of the United States economy and preventing the next crisis. Judges, don't let my opponent fool you. Repetition is not refutation. See him bring up new arguments this next speech. Unlike his last speech, we will see that the affirmative is clearly winning in both the short term and the long term. For all these reasons, I urge an affirmative ballot. Thank you. All right. I have two minutes and 37 seconds of prep time beginning now. All right, my prep time has expired. So as a brief off the clock framework, I will be responding to these same three points and addressing voting issues of my own. And with that said, I'm going to set the timer for four minutes. And if my judges as well as my opponent are ready, let's go ahead and get started. There are a few crucial points to understand in today's debate round, the first of which being the importance of the framework of today's round. Now, my opponent said that according to Coolidge guidelines, the framework is perfectly fine as he's addressed it, but this ultimately does not hold water because my opponent continues to ignore the wording of the resolution, the shutdown, the U.S. economic shutdown. So we are specifically examining the United States economic shutdown, however it looks, however it adds or detracts to predictability, however short-term or long-term it is. Now, this is important, um, and my opponent claims it isn't important, but this fact is important because this distinguishes predictability in the marketplace, as I said before. If we do not know how long the lockdown is going to be, then there will be unpredictability. Again, my opponent is trying to narrow the scope of the resolution to just a short-term argument when we are talking about shutdown as a whole, however it looks in the United States. And if those shutdowns keep happening as he says that they might, then that is the US shutdown of the economy due to coronavirus as well. Understanding this, it is very important, which leads me to voting issue number two, or, or point number two, health. And I have a few things to address. 
First is the point about beds and overwhelming ICU units. My opponent said that my argumentation proved this point. It did not do such. The point that I was making is that there weren't nearly as many beds necessary regardless of intervention. Yes, if it was a close number, if it was 95,000 to 96,000, you could make the argument about how we didn't overwhelm the healthcare system. But let me repeat, there were only 17,000 beds in use when there were 96,000 over the entirety of the United States. My opponent then went on to talk about lives. He said that 36,000 lives would have been saved if we stopped um, a week, if we shut down a week earlier. Well, let me repeat the statistic. Every month we continue the lockdown, according to MIT statisticians, we lose 65,000 lives. Think about that. And then my opponent did not try to provide a response to the Imperial College model, which has been disproven by the M American International, Ex excuse me, um, the American Institute for Economic Research. This has been statistically disproven, which leads me to point three, the economy. The economy. First, I'd like to touch on predictability with two points. One, factors of predictability. Factors of predictability. We need to understand that just the lockdown isn't what provides predictability in the marketplace. That's not the only factor. Knowing more information medically about COVID-19, having a vaccination, having remdesivir, having hydroxychloroquine, these add to predictability. And at the end of the day, they show us that my opponent's argument that just shutting down the economy is going to factor into that predictability is patently false. There are multiple factors of predictability, which is why we need to move into that argument about supply chain. Yes, it is important to hold up supply chains, but again, we're not just factoring in predictability based on shutting down. We are looking at predictability as a whole, which increases in the marketplace the more research and understanding we have of a pandemic. Moving forward to reopening, reopening. My opponent is saying that we will reopen and then shut down and reopen and then shut down. Well, if we do reopen and shut down, my opponent is again defending the shutdown of the United States economy due to coronavirus. He is defending that according to the wording of the resolution, according to the interpretation of that resolution on the Coolidge Foundation, that must be defended. Which leads me to my two voting issues. One, loss, loss. We have lost $7.9 trillion in GDP. We are at 15% unemployment. We have lost 38 million in unemployment and 100,000 small businesses have permanently gone out of business. Which leads me to my second voting issue, end game, end game. To which we have to ask, what is my opponent's end game? If he says we must be prepared to lock down in the future, my opponent is merely saying that we will infringe on liberty time and time again, shutting down the United States economy with no predictability. I say that we advocate for liberty, we advocate for the negative, and by doing so, we say that the shutdown of the U.S. economy due to coronavirus is not worth the costs. Thank you. Great job to our debater. Really fantastic work. These are the top two debaters, like Jared said, out of 92. What an incredible effort they've made in the last 48 hours. Uh, so thank you, gentlemen, for that tremendous effort. Uh, the work now turns to our panel of nine judges. We've got a lot of brain power on this Zoom call. They're going to consider your arguments, and we're going to come back to you, hopefully probably within about 10 minutes, about what uh, this is going to mean. And we're also going to be moving to an awards assembly. But right now, I think we want to try to just kind of give uh, peace and quiet to our judges. Gentlemen, you can relax and just kind of think about the good work that you've done. And I certainly would uh, invite Jared if he wants to add anything, but we really want to just let our judges focus. Uh, judges, you will be contacted by myself or Jared personally in order to get the decision. Don't blurt it out. Make sure you only communicate it privately to either Jared or myself with clear identification from who you are. So thank you, gentlemen. And uh, let's uh, not confer as judges, but individually make our own judge decisions. And we'll have one soon. Great round. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you.